Hello and welcome to the Wingate Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Martha Asti, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Wingate University. Francis Fukuyama's book, Trust, details the importance of trust in a democratic and market-based society. In this lecture, Dr. Joseph Ellis, Assistant Professor of Political Science, reveals how trust evolves in an individualistic society like the U.S. However, America is still a society of joiners who love getting together in groups. How can these differences be reconciled, and what does it mean for democracy? Let's join the lecture now, entitled Rugged Conformists. So far this uh, uh, last few weeks, we've been talking about Francis Fukuyama's book, uh, Trust. And you went and wrote a paper about trust, and then you're going to have a final about this as well. So just to recap kind of what we've done so far, and then to move in uh, to, uh, to some new material for today. We basically found out that trust, the reason that Francis Fukuyama is talking about it, is that trust matters for economic prosperity. And so those of you, uh, all of you that wrote your paper, looked at examples of trust interacting with a particular place, uh, whether that's the United States or Ethiopia or Germany or Spain or wherever that was. Okay. Uh, particularly, uh, Fukuyama is interested in what he calls spontaneous sociability. What was, uh, what was this definition? It, it sounds really, really fancy, but what did he say this basically meant? When we use the word spontaneous, it's sort of when we interact with people, how? Do what? As, as, as soon as possible in different ways, in ways that are not familiaristic, as you, as you mentioned. So spontaneous sociability is the idea that we interact with people voluntarily who are maybe not like us or from different places, different religions, different ethnicities, and so on, and we do this in a way that is almost spontaneous. And uh, just to recap once again, um, trust matters for economic prosperity, which means greater trust, easier economic and political transactions, less trust, harder to have those economic and political transactions. So we talked about, you know, the gentleman's agreement where Caleb and I uh, agree to a car and, and basically he is trusting that I'm going to sell him a car that basically is functional, uh, that runs, that works. And without that, that even small level of trust, we can't have the sort of economic relations that we like. So once again, this is an overview of things we've been doing that brings us to what we want to talk about today. We've looked at the last couple of days, uh, particularly on Monday, the American context of trust. And we said that the, uh, the United States is included uh, among the trusting societies. Um, and that it is a trusting society, Fukuyama claims, despite the fact that it is an individualist society, or at least people argue that it is. What does it mean that the United States is considered to be an individualist society? You're not forced to do a lot of things. Americans pride themselves on the fact that, the, that this is not a society that uh, is coercive. Uh, if you want to vote, you can vote. If you want to join a political party, you can join a political party. If you want to be religious, you can be religious. If you want to get married, you can get married. If you want to have kids, you can have kids. And none of those things are forced on you. None of those things are requisite. Um, Americans have a general distrust, it is argued, of any type of coercion. That's why Americans are generally seen to be very what we would call anti-government. They're not against government, they're just skeptical of it as a general principle. And so what we want to talk about today is we, we've mentioned the individualism before, but we want to try to figure out why individualism. Why is it that the United States has a kind of individualist character to it? And Fukuyama makes some provisional explanations for why that happens. And the first is what he calls the rights revolution in the United States. Okay, think back to uh, one of our very first lectures, and we talked about, uh, in the United States, we talked about the Bill of Rights. Do you remember this discussion, hopefully? Okay. The Constitution is a, is a sort of a two-part document. There are the articles of the Constitution, which sort of uh, delineate the powers, and then there's the Bill of Rights part of the Constitution, which basically protects who from what? Citizens. Protects citizens, individuals, from the government, or in some cases from each other. But by and large, the Bill of Rights is a document that embodies individualism. And so from its very beginnings, the Bill of Rights encapsulates individual rights. The right to expression, the right to religion, the right to bear arms. All of those particular rights that people, quote unquote, hold so dear. So for this reason, this is one of the reasons 
that people say Americans are such individualists, they believe in these rights, the right to do things. All right. Well, it's a little more complicated than that, uh, Fukuyama claims. Uh, what I want to do today is give you a short history on modern philosophy in comparison to ancient philosophy. We're going to talk about a couple people who you um, have uh, heard about before maybe, or maybe you haven't, uh, and that is uh, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Plato, and Aristotle. Now, we could spend the entire semester talking about these folks. We're going to do it in like 10 minutes, okay? Anyone ever heard of Thomas Hobbes before? Thomas Hobbes wrote a book in the uh, 1500s called The Leviathan. Uh, the Leviathan is a, a literal monster <coughs> and also a figurative one. And basically his argument was that, you know, government steps in uh, to protect us from each other. Because humans are pretty bad people. Now, now maybe not, they're not bad by their nature. He doesn't necessarily argue that. But when left alone, up to themselves, they'll engage in activities of self-preservation. And this self-preservation might include things like harming you to get something that you need to survive. So Hobbes isn't judging people. He's not claiming these people are evil. But he's saying we live in a context, a world, where we engage in activities that are unsavory. And so the Leviathan, which is the government in this case, steps in to basically protect us from ourselves and each other. And the only reason the government acts is to do basically that thing, to protect us from ourselves and each other. It is a very individualist proposition because he doesn't claim that government really serves any other purpose except to protect individuals. In essence, in essence. It's, once again, this is a big, long book. There's a lot more things we can say about it. We're just going to boil it down to, to its essence. Then came along John Locke. John Locke followed Thomas Hobbes. John Locke is pretty famous in this country for what reason? What do most people assume about him or think about him? He's famous in this country because uh, a lot of people believe he was very inspirational for Thomas Jefferson. They believe that uh, Jefferson read a lot of Locke in writing the Declaration of Independence which is why uh, Locke writes something to the effect of uh, life, liberty, and property. Jefferson wrote something to the effect of life, liberty, and what? It's pursuit of happiness. So it wasn't plagiarism, but it was inspiration, let's say. Well, Locke following Hobbes says, Hobbes is kind of right. He disagrees with Hobbes on some issues. He doesn't think that, that the state of nature is as nasty and brutish as, as, as Hobbes claims. But he says, look, the basic purpose of government, it's true, is to protect us. Not necessarily because people are going to always try to kill us for an apple, but because all of us want to live a life where we are free to live as individuals, live our lives, pursue our liberties, and protect our stuff. And that's Locke's big innovation. He says it's not, not so much that we're worried about someone killing us all the time, though that could be a consideration. We're worried about our stuff. One of the first things that human beings do once they sort of figure things out is they start to accumulate stuff. They want to protect that stuff. And the only way to reasonably do it is to have government as an impartial observer. You know, imagine Trent, OK? Trent, ha Trent, what's something that you care most about? Like a possession, not a person, but a possession. Truck. Your truck. You like your truck a lot? Yeah. Okay. Sarah steals your truck. She goes joyriding in your truck, uh, uh, flips it in a ditch, wrecks it, tears it all up, and Sarah goes, oops. Okay. Now, um, prior to government, uh, Trent's only option is basically to go after Sarah to try to make amends uh, however he can, to try to you know, get, maybe get revenge on her or something, or try to, try to take something of Sarah's back. Okay? In a modern political setting, if Sarah steals Trent's truck, goes joyriding, flips it in a ditch, uh, Trent, what is your, I hope, your first call? Uh, probably the police. Probably the police, yeah. You go to a neutral arbiter to sort out your dispute. Okay? 
and then you leave it up to the government to do that. You know, in this case, the police is an arm of the government, a function of the government. So what, what are we learning here? America has an individualist source because the sources of its political philosophy come from individualist type philosophers. We call it modern philosophy because modern philosophy changes the way we think about government. The modern philosophers start to think about government as kind of a necessary evil. We want to be individuals, we want to live our lives where we want to live it. The reason we need government is to do a couple things like sort out Trent and Sarah's dispute. But by and large, you know, governments can be intrusive. Government can do things that interfere with us. All we need it to do is sort out these particular issues. So when you read the Declaration, and when you read the Bill of Rights, you can read into it a very individualist type of philosophy. This is very, very different from the ancient philosophical model. Okay? If you read Plato or Aristotle, once again, we could spend years of our lives talking about Plato and Aristotle. Um, I'm going to try to boil it down in just uh, you know, a few words. But Plato and Aristotle reversed the idea of government. Hobbes and Locke said, you know, government's created because basically we need it to sort out these disputes. And they do so pretty fairly. If left up to Trent, Trent's going to do things to Sarah that are bad. Okay? Plato and Aristotle come along and say, well, they don't come along, they said this before, but uh, said, no, 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 this is not, you know, government's not about sorting out disputes. Government's about making us better. Government's about taking us from these animalistic qualities where all we care about is stuff and what's going on in our lives, and they try to make us real people, real citizens. That word citizen is a very, very important word <coughs> for ancient philosophers, particularly Aristotle. Aristotle has this idea, I, I say here social animals, some people have said that. Aristotle has this idea of the political animal. He basically thinks that human beings have not only a, um, a need, but also sort of an innate desire to be around other people, to be in a political setting. And without government, we are uh, animalistic. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not truly human beings. Okay. So let's tease this out. Let's think about this. The modern philosophers say, yeah, government's basically a necessary evil. It exists to sort out these disputes that we have, but by and large, we want to protect individuals to do what they want to do. Once again, this is summarizing a big, huge literature in two minutes. Plato and Aristotle say, no, 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 no. That's not what it's about at all. What it's about is government making us truly better people particularly Aristotle. Plato gets lumped in with Aristotle, but particularly Aristotle. He has this idea of this perfect place where everyone is contributing to politics. This is the, per this is the perfect place. Okay? And in the modern setting we say, gosh, government, leave me alone. Now, who has won the debate, at least in this country, uh, Aristotle or Locke? I've already given it away, but it's pretty obvious. Definitely. No one really talks about politics in this country uh, in the way Aristotle talks. I mean, some people do, but by and large, it's a losing proposition as a politician to say, uh, I am gonna, I'm an agent of the government, and I'm here to make you better. Not a lot of people say that, okay? Because as Americans, we believe it's not up to the government to make us better. It is up to us to make us better. You saw some of these issues come about in the passage of the health care law these past few years. So, the American Constitution obviously emphasizes the Lockean values over the Aristotelian values. The second component of individualism that we see, that's a major component of American history, is the rise of American Protestantism. We ended class with this on um, on Monday. And we talked about American Protestantism as, as showing, as being indicative, indicative of individualist 
values. Uh, what were some examples we gave that Protestantism was absolutely about individualism? What did we say? A lot of divisions and, and denominations. We ended the class on Monday talking about all the denominations, all the varieties of Baptists, the varieties of Presbyterians. Uh, uh, Methodists have basically one variety, by and large. Uh, but the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, uh, the various Pentecostal churches, the Church of Christ, the Christian Church, the Brethren Church, all of these various different churches where we can see in practice American individualism. We said, and, and Fukuyama uh, tells us about this in this chapter, Americans are a really, really religious people in comparison to who? The, the rest of the Western world, yeah. Americans are really, really religious compared to other uh, Western industrial countries. Despite the fact that we never had any kind of state religion. There were some individual states that had churches, but there was no federal church. So this is kind of interesting. You know, we, we, like I said, we ended class with this, but this is a very interesting moment. Americans are individualist because our political philosophy says we are. This is what we're told. And also, our religion basically tells us we are. Now, not everyone's Protestant, not everyone's religious, not everyone's Christian. We have to make note of that. Okay? But historically, Protestantism plays a pretty big role. And every single politician, uh, every single president, up until Kennedy at least, um, uh, came out of some sort of Protestant roots. Okay? Or at least they claimed it. Some weren't very religious, but they might have claimed some form of process, whether that was Presbyterian or Episcopalian uh, or whatever the case may be. But church, as we've talked about before, creates an interesting kind of dynamic. As we said, it's individualist. You look at the sorts of people that give rise to Protestant churches. I mean, you look at almost any Protestant denomination and there's a person you can talk about who gave rise to the church. And that person, more or less, disagreed with something someone else did. Martin Luther is, is one of the most obvious individuals. We can, you know, another example of this, we can look at um, Martin Luther King Jr. You know, basically, the letter from Birmingham jail, which is one of his most famous writings, is a big argument, both political but also theological, with members of his church. Well, not of his church in particular, but members of the Christian community. Fukuyama contrasts this with Confucianism, okay, with what he calls communitarian Confucianism, a religious tradition based on duties, obligations we have, and not rights. So our political system in this country and our religious system for most people in this country is overwhelmingly individualist. We look at countries that come from maybe Confucian type of backgrounds, and we see communitarianism, duties, obligations, not rights. And so that definitely changes the context of how we look at things. Okay, here's the issue with churches though. American churches emphasize, however, the divided loyalties of Americans. It's individualist in structure, but communitarian in membership. So in other words, these churches, by and large, have been built by people breaking away, doing something on their own. We haven't even talked, to, in fact, about the most interesting development in churches, and that's the non-denominational movement. Anyone know what that means, the non-denominational movement? There, there's no particular affiliation. Now, if we look closely at a lot of non-denominational churches, we will find out that their roots might be Baptist roots or Presbyterian roots or Methodist roots. If we look at the pastorate, or we look at the members. Oftentimes, members of non-denominational churches come from denominations. But the growth of this non-denominationalism tells us that there's something very individualist going on, like we've said. But here's the other thing. The membership is incredibly, incredibly communitarian. Meaning, what did, remember what to de Tocqueville, we talked about de Tocqueville and we said he saw what in Americans? Yes, they're individualist, but they like to what? Join. Americans are joiners. So this is the great challenge for people that study the U.S. and people have been seeing this for a long time now. 
But despite the fact that American political system and its religious system emphasizes individuality, Americans are joiners. They love to be members of groups. This is one of the reasons, among others, that the U.S. has a high level of trust. Yeah, I'm selling Francis Fukuyama's book for him on the television, by the way. So, yeah, he'll send me a, hopefully, send me a nice letter in the mail. <clears throat> Individuals and structure, but communitarian membership. When we join groups, what we basically agree to is get along with people. We basically agree to get along with people. We agree to do things for people voluntarily. We agree to contribute money to help people voluntarily. But despite the fact that the reputation of individual, individualism is lasting in the American context, by and large, we have communitarian impulses that still create this desire to join, to be members. I wanted to read to you, uh, and we'll discuss this, uh, a section of the book. Um, if you are looking in your text, the voluntary and entrepreneurial character of American religious life explains further how religious commitment could be renewed over long periods of time against the broader forces of secularization. When membership in a church extracts a high price in terms of emotional commitment and changes in lifestyle, it creates a strong sense of moral community among its members. A couple of things we have to tease out here. The first is this word voluntary, a word that we're familiar with, but the second is the word entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial. This word entrepreneurial, uh, we haven't used it yet in the context of this book, I don't think. What is, it, what is an entrepreneur, what does it mean to do something entrepreneurial? To discover, uh, do what? Start your, own Start your own business. That's a, a version of entrepreneurialism. But an entrepreneur is someone that is willing to do what? Take risks. Yes, that's a basic definition. An entrepreneur is someone that is willing to take on risk and do so, in this case, voluntarily. Now, oftentimes, Quincy, did you say start a business? Is that, or Michael? Michael. Oftentimes, we associate entrepreneurship with economics, business structure. An entrepreneur is someone like Ray Kroc or uh, Sam Walton, okay, someone like that. But entrepreneurialism, uh, entrepreneurialism is apparent in all types of societies, in various forms of society. So think about this for a second. Just in the context of the church, we can, we can look at other things. If you get mad at your church, and you decide to leave your church, and you decide to start your own church, there's a lot of risks involved. What are the risks involved in doing that? Which is, by the way, the story of all kinds of Americans have done this. What are the risks involved? No one will believe you. That no one will follow you. That's right. It's not, not that you're creating a new religion, not like you're a cult leader necessarily, but, but that no one will, will believe that you're onto something. Financial risk. Financial risk. That's a huge one. You've got to have a place for people. We know that people start in their homes, and as they get bigger, collect some money, they'll go and, and maybe find a place. But you've got to rent out a place, or you've got to go to a bank and get a loan, perhaps. You've got to build something. What other risks are involved? What do you really believe? So, so you, you leave your church. Will people follow you? Will a bank commit money to build a building? Can you, get, can you pay your rent? Can you keep the lights on? Okay. What do you believe? I'm not talking necessarily you leave a church and, and make your own church, per se. But certainly there is a commitment there that involves an incredible amount of not our, obviously, voluntary things, but entrepreneurial things. The risks taken to do this. So obviously, volun the voluntary relationship of this, the entrepreneurial idea of this, is very what? Individualistic or communitarian? Individualistic, that's right, not a trick question. It's very individualistic. I disagree with you, I'm going to do something else, I'm going to make it on my own. But then, 
as soon as that happens, the communitarian part of this kind of comes back in, which is the person leaves, they start their own church, and then what happens? Others join, and they agree to abide by certain norms and rules of activity. It's amazing. We said this on Monday. Despite the fact that Americans are individuals, they go and work for big companies all the time. They agree to all of the silly little rules that big companies may have. They agree to them. Now, maybe they want to get paid. Eh, I get it. But yes, there is absolutely an entrepreneurial character of individualism we see, just in the church context, but also a commitment to other people. I want to go in and read this last little part. The voluntary and entrepreneurial character of American religious life explains further how religious commitment could be renewed over long periods of time against the broader forces of secularization. So in other words, the more, church, the more new churches you have, the less religion is stale. You know, if you go to, to a church that's been somewhere for 400 years, uh, it could be there for another 400 years, but it's, it's too traditional. It's too set in its ways. Perhaps that's something that's not attractive to people. So they need something new. They need something vibrant to commit to. When membership in a church extracts a high price in terms of emotional commitment and changes in lifestyle. It creates a strong sense of moral community among its members. So we know that one of the things that religion does to people is it asks something of them. It asks people to give things up. It asks people to give their time. It asks people to refrain from certain activities. It asks people to do certain things. Think about in the Christian religion alone, the, um, the time of, uh, of Lent. What are you supposed to do in Lent? Give something up, okay? Now maybe it's chocolate, or maybe it's spending money frivolously, or maybe it's using bad language, whatever it may be. It's not like, you know, it's not a big thing. But it asks a commitment, not only of you, but of everyone that believes what you believe. In doing so, in asking this of individuals, in turn, we create a strong emotional commitment to not only these, these beliefs, but also to each other. A strong sense, he says, of moral community among its members. Let's leave the religion part alone for a second. But if you go work for a job, and obviously you're an individual, obviously you have some entrepreneurial things, but jobs are gonna ask you to commit to things. Jobs are going to ask you to refrain from things. Jobs are going to ask a lot of you. The more you abide by some of those things, you could reject them. But it's possible that the more you abide by the rules and norms of that particular place you're in, the stronger your what becomes to that place. Your bond or your attachment. It's a weird thing, but it's true. The more you commit to things, give up to things, burdened by certain things, the stronger your commitment to that thing could be. This all happens in our country. This individualist country, full of people willing to join. That's why this chapter is called Rugged Conformists. We all want to believe that we are individuals, we are our own man, our own woman. We can do whatever we want to do. We have the right to do whatever we want to do. And then when push comes to shove, what do we do? We join groups, we join churches, we take on jobs. We take on responsibilities, all for other people. It's an amazing thing. Any questions? Let's stop there. Dr. Joseph Ellis, Assistant Professor of Political Science, speaking on Rugged Conformists. We hope it spurred you to think about the delicate balancing act between individualism and community. Trust is and will continue to be a central feature of political life and a worthy topic for future discussions. I'm Dr. Martha Asty. Thank you for watching.